everybody, welcome into the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs Check-In. Open online today at wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. And as a reminder, we're available on all podcast platforms, so be sure to rate, subscribe. Tony and Draghi joined by Andy Martinez, and then our special guest, Eugene McIntosh, the co-founder of the Bigs Media. Guys, Cubs are coming off a sweep of the Rockies, a uh, 4-2 and two homestand. Eugene, we'll start with you. What initial takeaways do you have uh, from this homestand so far, but particularly the series of the Rockies here? Well, first of all, it, it was a must-win series, yeah. especially coming off of the one and five road trip last week, losing two or three in Colorado and then those three in Arizona, especially that that uh, that uh, extra inning when I think that took a lot of life out of those guys. But coming back here, obviously, like I said, must-win. The guys took care of business, blanked them to uh, game one, uh, game two, it was good to see Stroman back in the in the in the rotation, so that was cool. And then today, Jordan Wicks got the job done, and I think they got a little lucky. They had a hard time getting that big hit. I think they were f- five for twenty-five in the series with runners in scoring position. Oh, right. But you know, Patrick Wiz and P. Wizzy came up with the big bomb, and you know, a lot of guys just uh, taking advantage of opportunity. So uh, good momentum builder for those guys. Off day tomorrow. On Atlanta, man, and uh, this is uh, when you pick your big, pull your big boy pants up, you know. Atlanta's a, a really weird one because, like, if this was Atlanta a month ago, and and granted, like the Cubs took two out of three when Atlanta came here, so like I always kind of remind myself of that. But a month ago, Atlanta, when they're really clicking and they're fighting for a playoff spot, the last like week or two, Atlanta's kind of it's almost like coasting a little bit. They yeah. they it's they they've had some losses in there that like you're not facing. Uh, Freed or, or Strider or Charlie Morton, like you're avoiding their big guns. Yeah, Freed and Morton are both on the IL right, right. now. Right, yeah. and uh, their playoff status are kind of like in question. Like it's kind of a, there's never a good timing to face the Braves, but like I guess this is about as optimal as you would want to get. It's going to be interesting that series for them for the playoff implications. But just going back on this home stand, I think the thing that stood out to me and one thing that we've talked about a lot is like there. It always seems like the Cubs have like this big loss, and you're like this is like things are going to fall apart or the, the wheels are going to fall apart. And to me, the Pirates series, after the Pirates series, it was kind of the first time where I'm like, I think this is like really, like this is really the testing point. Like they're not in the playoff spot, like what's going to happen? And they come out and sweep the Rockies, which first of all, they should have done right. uh, because they're, they're an L worst team, but they went out and did it. Like it's still no, no easy feat to do. They still went out and did it, put themselves in the playoff picture where as some of the guys mentioned, like they control their own destiny, which – you would have signed up for this on, on March 1st if you would have told any Cub fan or any Cub player, like, hey, last week of the season, you control your own fate for a playoff berth. Yeah, I think that's really it. I mean, it, w- it was hard to look at this playoff race in the final week of the season and the Cubs go into that without a sweep of the Rockies. I mean, yeah. it's, it's always hard to sweep a team. Like, it just yeah. doesn't happen often, whether it's a 95-loss team like the Rockies and you're a team fighting for a playoff spot or, you know, a, a 100-win team and you're, you're on the other side of it. Like, it's just hard to sweep a team when you're at home. It doesn't matter if, you know, they're, they trot out three guys who have a 9.5, a 7.5, and, and a 5.5 and yet, right? Like, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just it's still hard to do it. They went out and did it, executed it. Now they get to write this next chapter. We'll see what that chapter is. Like you were saying, Andy, you know, it'd be really interesting to see how this next week plays out. I think to me that was just my takeaway it was like once again for the fifth or seventh or tenth time this year, the Cubs needed to do something. They stepped up and did it. So here we are entering this final week and the Cubs are in the playoffs. And this is what any of us wanted, like any of us covering. And we've talked all year in the press box about like, you know, we wanted to cover a team that was in it. It's more exciting and interesting than, you know, a team that's out of it or trading everybody away. Like it is, but obviously the fan base and Ian Happ said it really well too. Like any Anybody in that clubhouse would have taken this exact scenario on June 8th when they were 10 games under 500 or at any point in spring training. So I think it's just going to be super fascinating to see how the final week plays out. There's there's a lot of things like I think, you know, Gene, what you were saying about Stroman coming back in the rotation. I think that's huge, and especially to see what Assad did out of the bullpen. So I think to me, it's like looking at that, how the pitching lines up moving forward is going to be really interesting because Stroman will have another start left in the rotation. Asad will be in the bullpen, but they're not necessarily going to piggyback those two guys after. It's not going to be Stroman on Thursday in Atlanta and then Asad after. Ross said he's, they're going for wins. It's going to be Asad whenever they need it. So Gene, I'll start with you on this. Just like Stroman being back in the rotation, how big was that? What are you kind of expecting from him moving forward? And, and like what impact might that have on the rotation? 
Well, that's interesting because it's something that me and my guys, we've talked about for the last couple of weeks is like not knowing when Stroh was going to return, if he was going to return, if that was the last time we would see him this year or even possibly in the Cubs uniform. But now that he's back, we all know what he's meant to the team. He was obviously one of the best pitchers in the game the first three or four months. So just having him back in the clubhouse with his teammates is obviously giving them a boost of energy. So him having another start, I think, so it's still Tuesday, Tyon Wednesday, Stro Thursday, Hendricks Friday, and then I think it's Wicks and then Steele again Sunday. Yeah, that's a plan. So, I mean, we'll see what Stro does Thursday. Like you said, like we've witnessed all year. Aside, man, if if the Cubs do line up for that NL wild card, that division, you know, that wild card three game series, obviously it should be Steele and Kyle. That third spot, do do you have to go Stro? I, I I think maybe because of just who he is. It's, right. It's, it's, right. And it also depends on what Stro you're getting. Like I think when he first got back off the IL, those first two outings in, in relief, I was like, wow, he is kind of back to who he was three or four months ago, or excuse me, the first three or four months of the season. And then that first inning of that first start, he looked just as good, right? 16th pitch inning, kind of cruised through that inning. The sinker was was doing its thing. He was all the everything looked right, and then. Then the trouble kind of came. If he comes back in his next outing and, and he gives you three, four, or five innings, whatever it is, of solid run, of solid ball, like he's got that track record where you kind of feel comfortable that, like, okay, in a game three, theoretically, in the wild card round, like Strowman, you can go to him. All right. I'm not mad at it. I would, if, I, I would definitely probably give the nod to Stroh, like you said, just because of his track record. And I mean, I feel like he's, he's built for those big moments. Yeah. And even that last start, there were a couple times I saw him shaking his head three, four, five times on the mound. I'm not sure if he was upset with maybe his pitch location or if they were just dropping balls in the holes. But when he's on, when that sinker is sinking and he's able to throw that, get that slurve in there, when he's cooking, he's not a bad option for number three. But they ha- obviously they have to get in there and then they have to either split the first two or win the first two and just move on to the NLDS. So... Uh, I do think that just having Stroh back around is a huge momentum boost for those guys. And, you know, he's one of those guys. He's in tune with himself, takes care of his body. So um, I was talking to John Greenberg a couple of times when we didn't know what was going to happen with Stroh. And he's like, man, I think this might be the, the last we see of him. And I'm like, nah, man, Stroh is going to do everything he can, especially with the future up. You know, yeah. he, obviously he can opt back in. You know, he could opt out and go chase some money elsewhere. So, you know, it all depends, I think, on what these guys have in store down the line. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Stroh does Thursday. And man, these guys got to take care of business, man. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be super fascinating, too, because like you're talking about, Gene, like setting up the playoff rotation, right? Well, right now, Steele's pitching game 162 if they need it. Maybe they won't need it. And I think that's like really smart by the Cubs to have that lined up. If they have, if they clinch, you know, if the next six days go really well and five games go really well, they don't need steel on game 162. They'll figure something out. Now, I don't know exactly because they're only a half game behind the Diamondbacks as we're doing, as we're recording this podcast for the second wild card. You know, they're a game up on the, the Brewer, or sorry, the Marlins, you know, for the final wild card spot. The, both those teams have the tiebreakers over the Cubs. So there's like a lot to still be decided overall. But if you need one win and in, Justin Steele pitches game 162. That means that he's only pitching in the wild card round if he's on short rest. So then you might have Kyle Hendricks lined up for, you know, he's on, he would be on regular rest. Hendricks would be to go Friday and then game two of the wild card round. So you, you feel like if you have it clinched, you have Steele on regular rest or extra rest, and then you have Hendricks on regular rest for game two. And then Stroman has already come out of the bullpen. You've already seen success there, a guy who can go multiple innings. You either have him lined up for three, or if you need him, you bring him out of the bullpen in games one or two if you get to that point. Or he maybe is in line to start game one if you really need that. If you need Steele to, to go in game 162, like we're getting to the point where maybe Stroman is the option to start game one, yeah. which is not something any of us would have thought even possible a week ago or, or three weeks ago or a month ago. So it's going to be super interesting just to see how the next like 10 days plays out in that regard. And Jen, you mentioned an interesting name in Javier Assad. And when he when they announced Stroman was going back into the rotation, Assad was moving back to the bullpen. My first thought was like, man, like this guy's been pitching well as a starter, like kind of a harsh uh, turn of events for him. And then I was kind of thinking about it. It's like, well, if you, you have to move someone to the bullpen in this situation, right? And 
You're not going to move Justin Steele into the into the into the bullpen. You're not going to move Kyle Hendricks into the bullpen. You're not moving Jameson Ty into the bullpen. So that really leaves Wicks and Assad. And do you really want to put the rookie who's only pitched a handful of games, cha- totally change his routine and move him into the bullpen, or the guy who's done the bullpen role, been really really good at it, where he was getting votes as reliever of the month for I believe it was July. Like what if those are your two options? I think you go you kind of that that kind of answers itself in terms of who you want to go to to move to the bullpen. And really, that creates such a viable weapon. As Ross mentioned, like he'll he'll be available on Tuesday in the opener in Atlanta. Like, does he pitch? I don't know. But if he does, like that's that's some some calmness that you get in that you know someone that can go out there and give you a couple innings, have some shutdown innings. Like to to me, like that m- makes the bullpen deeper, right? And then you you talk about some of the guys that are having success, like a Drew Smiley or or a Julian Merriweather. Like it kind of lengthens the bullpen that. Like a week ago, we were kind of questioning like what happens with this bullpen, just given that Albert Alzelay's hurt, Michael Fulmer's hurt, and B- Brad Boxberger is coming out, and now he's on the aisle. Like moving Assad to the bullpen, I think is kind of a, a, a move that really lengthens their bullpen and and gives them a, an extra layer of security. Yeah, I mean let's let's stay on the bullpen. I mean, Gene, how do you see this playing out? Like like Andy was saying, Brad Boxberger placed on the aisle this weekend. You know, he's out with a forearm injury, missed four months with it. Sounds, you know, we heard today uh, kind of for sure from Ross that it doesn't sound like Fulmer's coming back this year. It right. seems pretty unlikely. Um, Mark Leder Jr. didn't pitch at all this weekend. Hasn't worked since Wednesday now. There were multiple close games on Saturday and Sunday where he could have been in there. And <laughs> Ross said, you can assume whatever you want. Uh, so, I, I mean, my assumption is the fact that he didn't even warm up is that he's something's barking and so, and we've heard that from Ross actually this entire month of September now you know dating back to that Cincinnati series to start the month so maybe lighters banged up with something or you know the workload's kind of getting them this is a guy who was a starter for almost his whole career you know had Tommy John surgery missed time and stuff but then he's like pitching full on wire to wire in relief for the first time in his life. So like 62 appearances I think is what he's at right now somewhere around there. So this is new for him and then I, you know, just in general, Gene, like, how do you see this bullpen shaking out? Because we don't know when Adbert's coming back. And then how does the rest, how do the rest of the guys fit in when you have to win a bunch of games and then maybe even get in the playoffs with these guys? That means that you need your starters to go as deep as possible. Yeah. And, and I'm old school, man. I'm from the, I'm from the era where guys went. And if we, I can't compare everybody to Roger Clemens and Nolan Ryan and right. Randy Johnson and those guys that would go 120, 125 and look like maybe they had another 25 left in the yeah. tank. But you're going to have to stretch these guys, man. And, you you know, you have to – Ross is one of those guys. He, you know, he has big-time faith in those guys. So when you look at a guy like Kyle Hendricks who's done it all, he's been there before. I think he's back to himself, the guy that we've – seen for the last six seven years so I think you can get a little more out of him Stro is always saying that he has a lot left in the tank um, when we get to the bullpen though like you said seeing a guy like Daniel Palencia you know you, these are going to be new moments for all of those guys even when you talk about Assad yeah. it's like yeah he's done very well out of the pen in the regular season but we all know that's a whole new ball game when those lights get so much brighter and every pitch every little inch every everything matters then so you'll be entering new territory with those guys so I mean for me it'll be a learning experience I'm not really expecting I have no expectations for for those guys Julian Merriweather he's been really good this year he's had a couple moments I love what he did yesterday getting the bases loaded getting out of the jam same thing today getting McMahon to end the game so Looking at the pen, Smiley, a guy, like you said, has been a starter all his life. Didn't have, started the season pretty well. Guys got a hold to that knuckle curve, and he looked like a shell of himself, but he's fought back. You know, demotion sometimes is good. You get to take a step back, you know, look at it from a different angle and come back, and, you know, you're able to help your team however. So those guys being able to come out of the pen and throw multiple innings, not just one inning and on to the next guy, I think that's something that Ross has done well with those guys, kind of stretching them out a little bit because you're going to need everything from them. So, again, I have no expectations on the bullpen. I think the best thing is for those starters to give as much as possible and leave as least as possible in the hands of the bullpen. And you touched on it a little bit, but I remember the Milwaukee start um, for Justin Steele here at home where that he has a laborious first inning and you're kind of like, oh, this might be a short inning or short outing. You might need to go to your bullpen and these are – must win games because at the time that the division was very much in reach and Justin Steele fights through it and and David Ross pushes him right to your to your point like he pushed him 
I think probably an extra inning and he, he got through it and that was huge. But to me, again, to your point, like the guys that I'm looking at aren't necessarily your Merriweathers and lighters. Cause like, yes, those are the big guys. And you, I, like I, you trust those guys that you can, that they can get those big outs, but like you need Palencia to step up. You need Jose Quas to step up. You like, you need these guys to, to Hayden be able to get, Hayden yeah. Like, right. hey, not for, yeah, yeah. Like you need these guys to be able to get these big outs in, in these moments. I thought Sunday's outing for Daniel Palencia was a good one because he's been so up and down, right? Like, he'll have one really good outing, and then he'll, he'll walk a lot of guys or, or struggle in the next outing. And then, like, it was kind of a seesaw. Like, I thought the Sunday's one of the best outings he's had. And I think if you have that, like, just given the stuff he has, right, where it's, it's 100 miles an hour in the zone, like, it can, it can really play. He's someone that if you can get him right, like, that could really be a difference maker for your bullpen. You're running out of time to kind of ma- to to have him like hit and 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 like be be a weapon, but if Sunday's outing is any indication, like then maybe you do have enough time per se. Yeah, I mean I, that's the thing, right? So off day Monday, then they play six in a row. Obviously, it'll depend who's available. Again, right. is Lighter available? Is he down a couple of days? Assuming Lighter is available, you have a, your starter maybe go five. But like this goes to back to your point, Gene. Like you probably need your starters to go deeper, especially in this stretch. But say your starter goes five. You piece it back with lighter and Merriweather in the eighth and ninth in some combination. Maybe Quas gets the seventh. Who gets the sixth? Some combination of Palencia or Wesneski or uh, Drew Smiley, depending on like the matchup. But I mean, you're piecing things together. Keegan Thompson's up. He's had control issues this year. You know, like he can give you multiple innings. So can Wesneski. Obviously, a side can do it too. But like, if you use a side for one inning, is he going to be able to bounce back after being on this starter routine for two months now? Like, is he going to bounce back and pitch the next day? There's just a lot of questions, and it's not an ideal spot to be in your bullpen right now. Edward, I was like, threw a bullpen Sunday before the game. We'll see how that plays out. I do. I anticipate he'll be back at some point, but I just don't know what version of him we're going to be. Is he is he going to be the guy that you know like ends up having like the amazing like fist pumps after games because he's so locked in? I, maybe not. Like maybe he comes back at seventy five percent, but like seventy five percent of Edward still probably is better than maybe some of the other options they have, or gives you a little bit of uh, more of a cushion, but. You're getting to the point of the season, crunch time, one week left, maybe play, you know, playoffs right after that. Like, your bullpen's a major question mark. That's not where you want to be at the time of the year that the bullpen is the most important time. Yeah, that's, that's to me, the, the biggest thing. And, and we saw it, like, with Edward Alzali. There was, there was at times when, before he went on the aisle, where you could tell he didn't have, well, it wasn't quite as sharp and he was still getting the out. So, to your point, like, 75% of Edward Alzali is still not necessarily a bad thing for, for, for the bullpen. Yeah, we're going to take a quick break here on the Cubs Weekly Podcast. When we come back, we're going to talk a little Miles Mastroboni, how he stepped up for the team, Patrick Wisdom, and then we're going to give our X Factors and uh, some predictions on how we think this final week is going to go. Get your Wintrust exclusive debit card. Get your Cubs card. Ooh, I'll take one. How much? Actually, they pay you $300. You heard right. Get a $300 bonus when you open a Cubs checking account with Wintrust. Enjoy all perks and purchase with pride every time with your Wintrust Cubs debit card. $300? What? I'll take a card. $300? Get your exclusive card at Wintrust.com slash Cubs. Only $100 required to open. No monthly minimum balance and no monthly maintenance fees. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Hey, everybody, welcome back into the Cubs Weekly Podcast. Tony Andrecki, Andy Martinez, Eugene McIntosh. Eugene, happy birthday, by the way. I totally forgot in the intro as I as I introed you to start. And right after I was done, I was like, oh, my God, we just talked about this. So happy birthday. Thank you so much for hopping on here with us. Anytime, my brothers, man. It's, uh, it's a blessing to be here, man. You know, it's uh, I don't want to give my age. But <laughs> 21 looks good. Yeah, 21 yeah. looks good, man. I've uh, I've been around. I've I've seen a lot. But every time I'm here, I tell my guy Chris all the time, it's like, this is my eighth year on the beat. It's like, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, I'm on my way back to Wrigley. It's like job. But it's like, sometimes you got to take a step back and it's like, you can't really take this for granted, you know? So just being here for the last regular season game on my birthday in the podcast with you guys, man, I wouldn't have it any other way. So I appreciate the love, man. I'm honored that you chose to, to spend the evening of your birthday doing the podcast with us. So so we'll kick it right to you. So Miles Mastroboni, we've seen, has had a really good week. I, I mean, this is a guy who came up, didn't play at all basically for a month, but all of a sudden he's out there you know, playing really well. Jamer Candelaria and Nick Madrigal are on the I.L. Patrick Wisdom plays against the lefty, hits a, the game-winning home run on Sunday. So like, what do you make of this third-base situation and, and how Mastroboni and Wisdom with – 
barely any playing time have stepped up and succeeded. Well, it's just like what you said about the bullpen, piecing things together. It's hard. You know, we talk to these guys all the time, and it's like when you don't – hitting in the cage is one thing, but when you're called spur of the moment, bottom of the seventh, runner on base, you're down one and you need to come through for the team, it's really the hardest thing, in, sport, in my opinion, in sports to do is to just come off the bench – take a couple practice swings and then get in there and you don't know what's coming. Hit 100 mile an hour. 100 mile yeah, an yeah. hour, stuff moving all over the place. So big shout out to Mastro for, and Pat, you know, like I just said, sometimes demotion is good. You, you get a chance to, you don't have all this weight on your shoulders. Like you feel like every time you're looking over your shoulder, if you do something, you make an error at third base, it's like, you know, so. P. Wizzy always coming through. Obviously, we know about the swing and miss, but on the other side, there's that, that power that the Cubs really need. Yeah. You know, so him and Mastro, man, I think the Cubs are in good hands, man. With, you know, um, Mastro, man, y- y- I can't say enough about him. The last week, the last week, especially since Madrigal's been down, and being a defensive sub at third, I mean, that says a lot. That's, that shows how much faith Ross has in him. Taking those opposite, getting those opposite yeah. field hits, getting the first, swiping, swiping second. You know, Mastro has been one of these, one of the keys down. You know, this last couple of weeks. So I think going forward, what's the update on Candelario? Do we know? Doing baseball activities. I mean, they thought the potential that he might be back on Sunday. Obviously, he was recording Sunday evening and he didn't come back. So he was still doing baseball activities. Took some grounders at third today, and then Tuesday is the other option. But it's a back injury. The Cubs want him to come back and be 100% when he does. And also, I, I got to be honest, that's part of why, like, I, I, when I was thinking about, like, podcast rundown is, like, maybe you don't rush him back if you got Wisdom and Master Boney playing well. And that combination at third base get, takes the pressure off Candelario. It, it allows him to get healthy to the point where he comes back and he's the best version of himself down the stretch. So, I, I mean, that's what I'm wondering is, like, if, if they feel confident in these guys, maybe they push him to Wednesday or Thursday. I don't know. That, that, that was what I was going to say, too. Like, to your point with Mastro playing so well, like, if, he, if, if Jamer is healthy, doomed healthy enough to come back on Tuesday and they want to bring him back, how do you kind of take Miles Mastroboni out of the lineup? The yeah. way he's hitting, especially against right-handed hitters, like he's probably your your best, at least right now on the active roster, he's probably your best third defensive third baseman. He's one of your fastest runners, and he's hitting a, a good bat, right? Uh, Sunday snapped the four-game hitting streak that he had. Um, but it's it's an interesting conundrum you're in, right? Like if Jamer Candelario gets activated, do you is your best lineup maybe Miles Mastroboni at third base, Cody Bellinger, at, or Jamer Candelario at first base and Cody Bellinger at center field? It, I, I would have a hard time arguing against that, right? Especially uh, At least given matchups, right, against a right-handed yeah. hitter. It, it's an interesting situation that, that that would create. And one, to me, like, I don't know about you guys, but it would it would have been unthinkable a month ago, right? We talked about on this podcast, like, the Nick Madrigal injury, to me, when it happened, was like that. I, I thought that was, like, going to be the one that could really hurt this team the most because Jamer Candelario was already hurt. Nick Madrigal was your best defensive third baseman, and he was hurt. And it kind of created this question mark where is it going to be Patrick Wisdom and Miles Mastroboni, this guy who hasn't really gotten any at-bats in a month. And he's come in here and he's looked like he's been hitting or he's been playing every single day all year. It's, it's, to me, it's kind of an incredible story, something that kind of almost can't be overstated or overlooked, just how important Miles Mastroboni has been in this, in this one-week stretch that he's been playing. Yeah, I think it's just cool to see the rest of his teammates and coaches be really happy for him too, yeah. right? Like, this is a guy who started here. Uh, this is his first season in Chicago, really struggled. And the fan yeah. base was like, you know, wondering what this dude brought to the team and all of that stuff. And like, he admitted that those struggles were difficult. He was trying to make a name for himself. But like, that bouncing up and down between AAA and the big leagues, then like we said, being back here for, for a month and just, you know, working hard, having a positive attitude, as Russ said. And, and then, you know, playing really well and like you can see the guys how happy they are for him in the dugout on the field or in the clubhouse you know like dabbing him up after he does his post game interview and you know Adbert went by after um, we talked to Master after the game on Saturday and like give him a big hug because you know he had a really nice game and like yeah. he like you you said the stolen base too like that stolen base in Saturday's game ended up leading to to one of the key insurance runs so like he's done a little bit of everything but it's kind of cool like I, I think it just goes back to like a team, a good good teams at this point of the year. They have those 
unexpected contributions from the Miles Masturbonis or the Patrick Wisdoms or whatever else. They, they have guys step up in moments, and that's what I think is so cool about this, but I think it's also under, underscores the fact that this is a pretty special season for the Cubs. We still don't know if they're going to make the playoffs for sure, but like things have aligned to the point where like the unexpected contributors are coming up. And I, I just, I always love that about baseball is you never know who it's going to be. And he might step up and get eight hits over a four game stretch. Like you just never know. Um, all right. So let's, let's project out a little bit here. So okay. final week of this season and then into the playoffs, let's say, who is going to be the X factor down the stretch? Andy, let's start with you first. Who is your X factor, you think, on the Cubs over at least this last week and then maybe in the playoffs if you want to take it there? Yeah, I think for me it's a no-brainer. It's Cody Bellinger. And we've talked about – I mean, we first of all, we saw it in May, right? When he yeah. was out of the lineup, we saw the struggles that the Cubs offense had, we, the struggles that the Cubs had overall. And when he was going well, when he was player of the month and having all the success, David Ross talked about how important he is to the team. And we've, we've kind of seen it, right? Like anyone that's been watching the Cubs has seen how important – Cody Bellinger is he's when he's going the Cubs are going and I look back to once the the Diamondback series started the at home when the Cubs struggles really started uh, I looked up Kyle, uh, Cody Bellinger's numbers and in that time he's hitting 211 with a 288 on base percentage 386 slug and an 81 weighted runs created plus over what period of time since not, uh, September 7th okay. so that that home game against yeah. uh, the Diamondbacks that was the first game to to um, I believe this is going into Saturday so the worst really? stretch of the season since yeah. June, yeah. There's no coincidence, right? Like, Cody Bellinger's been their best hitter. He struggles. The Cubs' offense has been struggling. Obviously, they had some success against the Rockies, and Cody Bellinger didn't have as great – he didn't put up the numbers that you would expect, but, like, it shows that they can win without him. But really, like, at the end of the day, if they're going to beat the Braves, if they're going to beat the Brewers, if they're going to beat teams in the playoffs, like, you need Cody Bellinger to be hitting. That's what we saw when the Cubs were going well, when the Cubs got went from 10 under to 10 uh, over at one point. Like, Cody Bellinger has to be the X Factor, and, and I really think he could be the X Factor into whether or not this team can do something in the playoffs or, or even get into the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue with that. He's clearly the team MVP this season, and he's going to get some NL MVP votes. So I think that's a good one, Andy. Gene, who are you picking? Who's your X Factor in the Cubs? My X Factor is Dansby Swanson, man. Um, I've been thinking about this for the last couple of weeks. When I asked Ross in the presser, I think it was Friday, watching watching Dansby close and like I said he's made 10 11 was yesterday's 11, was that an error 11, yep. yeah. so six of his 11 errors have come in this last stretch where he hasn't had an off day right. and I, I I as you know Ross is going to be in favor of his players going to protect them at all times but to me when I look at Swanson close I'm wondering like I said physical wear and tear is one thing we all know at most of these nobody's healthy fully healthy right now right. a lot of guys are running on fumes when you get to the big game, you maybe get an extra boost of energy. Obviously, Swanson World Championship with the Braves, played 162 both seasons, previous seasons. So he's done this before, but this is a whole new ball game over here. Now, you know, he's $177 million man. You know, it's a lot. I'm wondering if he's trying to carry a lot of that weight on his shoulder. So when I look at him, I'm wondering, is there, any, is there like some mental wear and tear there? Obviously, Ross said he didn't think so. Again, protecting this guy, but when you see him make some of those uncharacteristic errors that he's made those last couple of weeks, I'm just wondering how much of a toll th this new situation is taking on him. But moving forward, I do think that, you know, once these games, this last week, how important it is, I do think he'll rise to the occasion. And like you said, I feel like he's just as important yeah. as Cody Bellinger, especially defensively. I feel like him and Nico up the middle have probably been the best defensive duo up the middle so regardless of his struggles at the plate he did have a couple bombs this last homestand but regardless of his struggles at the plate you need him to be a one a plus glove defensively so um that's my x factor man but i'm looking for him to definitely definitely step it up this last six games and in, into uh into the playoff yeah i think that's a great one too just because like uh, absolutely like you know two game or two errors in like a three game span in this homestand like and the first one that he had ended up being huge that you know leads to a loss against the Pirates. But I think it's also offensively and like the fact that Dansby has come up with runners on base and runners in scoring position so much over this stretch as well. So like, yes, Bellinger has struggled and that's impacted the team offensively. And Dansby's had some big hits, but he also has not come through in a lot of moments offensively. So And not to cut you off, no, you're good. a couple times I saw the opposing pitcher basically pitching around Bellinger, Bellinger yeah. 
to get to Swanson. I'm yep. like, man, I, if obviously if we can see it, he knows him. And it's like, again, that's a lot of weight. It's like, man, I know he's not pitching around. I know they don't think I'm sweet. Right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So I definitely think that's in the back of his mind. But I think he's built for the challenge and he, he's going to step it up. No, I agree for sure. I mean, everybody has said in that clubhouse that like the reason for their turnaround, Dansby Swanson is at the forefront of that, like his championship mentality, what he's done defensively, what he's brought to this team and the culture is such a huge part of that. So um, I absolutely agree. Like he's he's definitely an X factor for me. I, I'm going to have a tie in the sense of. Drew Smiley and Marcus Stroman for my X Factor down the stretch. Going back to what we talked about earlier in the podcast of Smiley, I think, is huge. He's been so good out of the bullpen. He obviously struggled a bit, you know, in the rotation, but like they've needed a lefty for a long time in the bullpen, all year really, because Brandon Hughes has been down. So let's look at your next two opponents, or next four opponents, actually, if you project out all the way to the NLDS Atlanta, Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Atlanta. Maybe right now, like <laughs> right. that's the plan. Right. Or if not Milwaukee in that first series, Philadelphia. Right. And then if not Atlanta, L.A. Well, what do all those teams have is left-handed power hitters, guys in the middle of their order, the Matt Olsons, the Freddie Freemans, Christian Yelich, um, what's the other team? Oh, Kyle, you know, Schwarber. Kyle Schwarber, Bryce Harper. Like there's, there's a need for a left-handed reliever that you can go to, but also because of all those other guys, you need somebody to step up. So that's Drew Smiley. He's been there before. He was on that team that Dansby was on, the, the Braves team that won. Smiley pitched in the bullpen down the stretch in the playoffs for that team. I think he's huge for a lot of different reasons for that. And then I think Stroman is just because I am so curious to see how they use him after this start, after the start on Thursday. Like, if he relieves at all, if they get in the playoffs and he starts game one. Like, I just think that's a super fascinating storyline here as we get out, you know, get to that point. But, like, if anybody can rise to the occasion, and going back to what you were saying, Gene, earlier in the pod, it's like, it's Strowman, and he can do that. He can feed off that energy. Like, he put the team on his back on uh, more, Memorial Day, was it, where the Rays were in town, you complete, complete game, game shutout, one nothing victory. Like, he is the guy that is capable of doing that, I'd say, as much as anybody, like, as much as Steele, as much as Hendricks. And to have that third option, that was what everybody felt so confident about going up to the deadline is you have three really good starting pitchers. Strowman was included in one of that. If he gets back to that point, I mean, this team – absolutely has the runway to take off regardless of all these other bullpen question marks. And uh, to your point about Drew Smiley, I think there's the other big thing about having a left-handed reliever is even like, it's just the illusion of it too, right? Yeah. Like I, I think back to the uh, 2019 World Series, if you remember the Astros didn't carry a single left-handed reliever against the Nationals and the Nationals had Juan Soto on that team. And it's like, I, I know Juan Soto that year had reverse splits and it like, yes, he hit lefties better, but like, it's still something about a left on left matchup that, especially in the World Series, that could could be the difference. And obviously, that wasn't the reason the the, the Astros won the World or lost the World lost Series that year. But like, just that having that illusion of like, okay, this Drew Smiley's warming up. Yeah. Like, do, does that force the manager to maybe pinch hit someone or like to, to to do something? Like, it's just that illusion that has managers thinking. Whereas like, to your point earlier on the season when it was just Mark Leiter Jr. It's like okay, well, like I can still stack a righty against him, or I can still go lefty. Like there, there's no threat of having of of uh, there's no threat when there's no lefty in the bullpen like that. For sure. All right. So in continuing with projecting out, how does this next week go, Gene? We're gonna start with you. How does this next week go for the Cubs? Do they make it in the playoffs? What seed do they get? All of that kind of stuff. What are you expecting? Man, I expect four and two. I, I think they finished the week four and two. I think they'll fare well against Atlanta. Like you said, uh, Strider went today in a doubleheader, right? Yeah, he did. And then Morton and Freed, that's wild. I didn't know. I didn't. That's, yeah, today, yeah. yeah. Uh, Strider, or um, excuse me, uh, Freed was the other day, but Morton was today. That's yeah. wild. So they'll fare well against Atlanta. It's not going to be easy going into Milwaukee. I don't care if Burns, Woodruff, Peralta, if they sit them and bring some guys up or whatever. That's not going to be an easy series. They'll be looking to play spoiler as much as possible, but I do think the guys will go in there. Maybe, like you said, Tony, the Marlins, I'm not sold on. Yeah, same. The Diamondbacks, I don't know. They'll be in, They'll be on the south side. Does the series start tomorrow? Tuesday. Tuesday. Because of the, the, the hurricane. The hurricane, right, right, right. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sure the north siders are rooting for the south siders this, this first half of the week. But I do think the Cubs will end up with that third wild card spot, and maybe we'll just stick around in Milwaukee after Sunday, yeah, and maybe. you know, just hang around in Milwaukee until the the, uh, the the wild card series starts. So I do think they'll get in, long like you said, as long as they handle business. I feel like they got enough guys in that clubhouse who've 
risen to the occasion when you talk about Gongs with a ship and Belly with a ship and Swanson with a ship and Kyle still there from 16. So they have enough guys that can kind of rally the troops, bring those the rest of the group up. And like you said, the Strowman and Smiley, I'm 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 interested in that now that you brought it up, especially Smiley. Like you said, Hughes being down all year, no lefty at all, and again, demotion. Yeah. The look on Smiley's face when he had when he came and talked to us the other day, and he's like, Man, I know that I have to give this team all I can. And whether that's coming out of the bullpen, whatever the situation is, that's my job and I'm looking for Drew Smiley to be one of those X factors to get those guys in the in uh, that wild card spot. Yeah, um, I was going to say four and two too because uh, and it I'm puts him at eighty six wins. Then right, right, yeah. I, and I'm sticking with four and two. I, I'm not going to change my, my my mind just because you said right, something. Right. But, we but, see eye to eye. Right, 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 right. For, like I, I think the break, I, the break series is going to be tough no matter what, and and it's just going to be curious with how they play. Like I don't think Acuna will play all three games. Like I don't think all these like. All their starters are going to be playing all three games because you want to get them off their feet. You want to you want to keep them in rhythm, but you don't want to have the, wear them out before the playoffs. And I think Milwaukee probably will be in that same boat, right? Like they've already clinched the playoffs about their magic numbers one in the division. Like they're probably going to be taking it easy um, in that that last series. Like I don't think you'll see Devin Williams more than once in that in that series. It's going to be a it's it's set up where the yes, like these are tough matchups, and and by no means is it easy for the Cubs, but. I, I, again, I think it's much better to be facing these two teams in this point of the season as opposed to even like two weeks ago, like when they're still chasing the playoff spot. So I think it's lining up for the Cubs well. My only worry is like Milwaukee, right? With it, it, They can kind of control who they face in that first round, and maybe they do take it a little aggressively. Like maybe they don't want to face the Cubs in the first round at home where like there's going to be a large contingent of Cubs fans and it's a tough team that they would have to play with the pitching matchups and everything. Like, Maybe they try really hard to try and knock the Cubs out so that they face Miami or Cincinnati or et cetera, et cetera. That's, that'll be my kind of the one thing I'll be looking at for, for this week. Yeah, that's a really good point. I never even thought about that, of uh, like Milwaukee controlling their destiny of who they're playing against. Right. They also could control it by punting off their games of the series and letting the Cubs get up to the second right, wild right, spot. So, right, you know, they right, can right, go a bunch true, of different true. ways. <laughs> um, how I think it's playing out is Cubs win the division. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That'd be I mean, it's still run. mathematically possible. Right, right, Milwaukee, right, right, like right. you said, they would have to lose the next six. Cubs would have to win the next six. So it's still mathematically possible. Not going to happen. I right. mean, I, I think – I honestly still think that the Cubs might get the second wild card spot. Like, the Diamondbacks, the schedule that they have with losing their off day Monday, having to play in New York because of the hurricane weather, and then, you know, yes, playing the White Sox, but then they have to play the Astros at the end of it too, and the Astros are fighting tooth and nail to yeah. get in the playoffs. They uh, – I can't remember how they everything played out. Royals. Okay, so, like, yeah, you know, they – they're fighting for the division. They're fighting for a playoff spot. They're fighting for all that. And this is the Astros, like a team everybody expected to win that division. So I think, yeah, it's going to be super interesting. And, like, Woodruff, Peralta, and Adrian Hauser are the guys that are projected to throw right now if the Brewers keep everybody on the right rotation in that final series. I mean, really, would you want Woodruff to go more than a couple of innings? You No, you want him to maybe throw 60 it's pitches. Yeah, and, and make sure he's good. And, like, Devin Williams, like, do you really think that he's going to throw after Friday? Like, maybe if he's really efficient on Saturday. But, like, otherwise, no, you probably want him and, uh, you Brian know. Thompson, Ebay, yeah. like all those yeah, guys. Yeah, you want those guys probably to get Saturday and Sunday off and Monday and then be super fresh for Tuesday and Wednesday and whatever else. So it, it's going to be really interesting. Christian Yelich, his back has been barking on him. You know, he's missed a lot of September here. Came back super strong Friday night. But, like, maybe he doesn't end up playing. Like, it – what you said, Andy, is so true. Is like you'd rather be playing these teams right now. The Braves have a four-game lead on the Dodgers for the the number one seed in the NL. Like they're probably going to be able to coast. Like there's just a lot of things that are kind of working in the Cubs' favor. A team that has to win just about every game or every night. So um, I, I that's my projection. I think the Cubs get to the second wild card and end up going to Philadelphia on Monday to play on Tuesday. That's how I think it's gonna play out. So the Cubs, so right now the Diamondbacks have a half game lead? Yeah. But really like a one and a half one game lead because of the tiebreaker. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So it, it's going to be really, really interesting down the stretch. I mean, this is part of the beauty of having the extra wild card spots too. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. But stay tuned here on the Cubs Weekly Podcast. We'll have you covered all week long. Tune in to MarqueeSportsNetwork.com as well uh, for all of your coverage over this final week. For Eugene and Andy, I'm Tony. Thanks so much for listening and tuning in.